All right. Good morning. How's everybody this morning? You know, I mentioned to you for the last few weeks that we were going to uh, start something that's a little more meaty in nature. Um, it's not that I'm the only one that teaches it when I make this statement, but it is something that has not been taught uh, in quite some time. Uh, in order for you to understand rightly dividing your Bible, this doctrine that I'm going to show you over the next uh, few times is a, probably the most fundamental, foundational um, thing that you could learn as far as doctrine is concerned to understand that this all started when it comes to the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. The whole thing started over a throne and continues to be a struggle for the throne. The issue in the Bible is, has to do with the throne or who is ruling. Now, I've mentioned to you before, apologize for my back being to you, I've mentioned to you before that this is seen in type in the Christian life. In the Christian life, it's who's ruling your life. You get saved and then you become a new creature in Christ. He said, put off the old man and put on the new man. The struggle for every Christian in the day and time in which you live is, even after you're saved, is you become, in a sense, schizophrenic. Brother Woodard, that's beige, not tan. Uh, and so what, what, uh, what has to happen is, is you have to realize whoever you yield the throne to is who controls your life. The example is this. If you're on the throne, then Jesus would be on the cross. If you're, He's on the throne, then you're on the cross. Paul said, I die daily. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So there's a constant struggle over who's going to be seated on the throne of your household and rule your flesh. Now, your soul is a whole different deal altogether. Your soul is sealed to the day of redemption. And that's why it's important for you to understand some of these things I'm going to show you. In the Old Testament, nobody could go to heaven because there wasn't heaven for them to go to in the sense of their sins being paid for. You have a couple of exceptions to that. Three of them come to mind right off the bat. Number one is Enoch, who's a tight picture of the church. Enoch walked with God and he was not. He caught up before the flood, picture of the rapture happening. Then you have a man named uh, Moses who the Lord uh, killed and buried him and then he resurrected his body according to what Jude says and took his body up there to heaven. He appears later on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17. And then you have another fellow, a preacher by the name of Elijah, who crosses the river Jordan and goes there. The Lord comes down and picks him up in a chariot and carries him to heaven. Everybody else on this side of Calvary, and when I'm pointing to this side, I mean everybody else up until the time Jesus died on the cross, when they died, they went to the heart of the earth. In the heart of the earth, there's a compartment down there. That compartment is hell, paradise, uh, Abraham's bosom. People say, why do you say paradise, Abraham's bosom? Well, how could there be Abraham's bosom before Abraham was? So it's paradise that's there before. And before Jews were around, Abraham is Jewish, then there were Gentiles. Contrary to popular belief, Jews, I mean, uh, Adam and Noah and those people before Abraham were not Jews, they're Gentiles. They're, you're, you're, uh, you are Gentiles, you're not Jewish. Now, you've got to be careful because nowadays there's many false teachers, and I say that charitably. I'm, I'm sure they're just misinformed, but they're trying to teach what's called Reformed or Replacement Theology, meaning that you replace the nation of Israel. You don't replace the nation of Israel, and I can't emphasize this strongly enough. You don't want to replace the nation of Israel. Now, if you replace the nation of Israel, then you place the church in the tribulation, going through the tribulation, and then you add works to your salvation. Anytime you do that, you're headed for trouble. Now, the people say, well, yeah, but you get to inherit the blessings. All the blessings for the Jew are equated with this, and they're physical blessings. They're things that take place on the earth. That's the healing that you get. That's the signs, the wonders, the miracles. That's the, the other stuff that you get that get taken care of there. Has to do with nothing but physical things on the earth. This is a spiritual kingdom. Physical kingdom, spiritual kingdom. Both kingdoms are here when the devil is first here. We're going to start here in just a second. But for you to understand maybe more clearly in the long view 
When Jesus Christ shows up on Calvary's cross, they don't expect Him to come and die. They expect Him to bring in the kingdom. In Acts chapter number 1, even after He's resurrected, it'll be around verse 6 or 7 there, they say, the apostles say to Jesus, Have you now come to restore the kingdom to Israel? The kingdom was a literal, physical, earthly kingdom. That's why nowhere in the Old Testament does anybody see a spiritual kingdom. Every time you get yourself into trouble in the Bible, it is when you try to place the wrong kingdom in the wrong place. If you put the kingdom of heaven in the church age, then you've added works, you've added signs, wonders, and miracles, you've added physical blessings, you've added proof of salvation by what God's doing for you. In the Old Testament, if God was blessing you, one of the things He would do is you'd be healthy because sickness was a sign of sin. The nation of Israel knew that. Uh, the woman that had the issue of blood for the 12 months and so on, so, or 12 years, 12 is a number for Israel. All of those signs were for Israel. He came and he remitted the sickness, showing that he could remit sin. You don't get a guarantee that you're not going to be sick. There's no promise for that. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul winds up after he meets with the Lord over there, he travels with a doctor. He obviously has more problems than just his eyes, which is probably what happened to him when he was blinded. But he has a thorn in the flesh, the Lord said, to keep him down, to keep him humble, but also to make him a minister. You're not promised every health and wealth and well-being and prosperity and, and children and, and uh, all these things that they promise you all the time. Every faith healer you hear will say this. They'll probably start off this way. Uh, do you want to be sick? Well, nobody that's sick wants to be sick. Well, would you like to be healed? Well, sure, I want to be healed. Absolutely, I want to be healed. Well, come down here and then we'll do that. There's no guarantee of healing. They'll quote to you James chapter number 5. James 5 has to do some things with the tribulation, which we'll get to in a little while. It has nothing to do with you now. I believe in going to the hospital. I believe in praying for people before and after surgery. I believe in praying for them before and after babies. I believe in praying for them if they got the flu or they got anything else. When I'm sick, I pray the Lord will get me well. And a lot of times what he does, he says, take aspirin or go see the doctor and get antibiotics or have enough sense to, to stay in. You're contagious or whatever. Sometimes he makes me sweat it out. But he does heal me eventually. It's just, you know, it feels like the tribulation while you're that way. The older you get, the more when you get sick, the more you feel like, man, this is terrible. I can remember getting the flu when I was younger and work right through it. Now you get the flu and you feel like, where's the coffin? <laughs> They're fixing to bury me. I'm dying. I've got to be dying. I can feel this bad, you know, but you're not. It's just because you're getting older, it has a bigger impact on you. But ladies and gentlemen, as you go through this day and time, you're living in a day and time where people are still trying to resurrect the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is not for you. Now let me show you this thing here. Father, bless your word and help us as we go through it. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I didn't have a red marker. I realized that red and black are probably the easiest colors for you to see back in the back. But I want you to look first of all at the kingdom of heaven. Now they're both kingdoms are not the same. The reason that they say the kingdoms are the same is because when the Lord comes, He preaches in one place, the kingdom of heaven's at hand, mostly in Matthew, about 33 times in 32 verses, and doesn't say a lot until He gets into uh, uh, Mark and Luke about the kingdom of God. In the book of Acts, you don't find the kingdom of heaven at all. You only find kingdom of God. In Galatians, you find kingdom of God. You say, why? This is after Calvary. This is a spiritual kingdom. So the Lord offers that kingdom to the Jew. He makes some hints that there's going to be another way in. For instance, in a couple of places He'll say, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, a hint that you can get His righteousness, not your own righteousness, and then you inherit this, Seek ye first, then all these things will be added to you. Now, if you're a modern charismatic, you say, If you seek God first, then God will give you health and wealth and prosperity and all that. That's not even the context of the passage. The context of the passage is, here's a thief on the, call, the cross. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Both of them right there on Calvary. So both kingdoms are offered. The Lord's offering that to the Jew. They never saw the spiritual kingdom, though He's offering those kingdoms to Him. And I'm going to get to that in a second. But in the long look, this kingdom of heaven is all the way down. It's on the back side of this. I'll show you the chart in a second. All the way down to the millennial kingdom. 
the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ comes and rules and reigns on the earth for a thousand years. That's what the Jew was looking for. The Jew is looking for the kingdom of heaven, which is a literal, physical, earthly kingdom that's going to be around on the face of this earth for a period of a thousand years. And then at the end of the thousand years will come the battle of Gog and Magog. That's the devil that's loosed for a little season. He comes up, he goes and goes to the north country up around Russia. He gets him a group of people and he comes against the Lord and against Jerusalem. And this time the Lord fights that battle. You're not involved in it. The second coming of Christ, which we'll talk a little bit about in the morning sermon, has nothing to do with the battle of Gog and Magog. The second coming of Christ has to do with the battle of Armageddon when the Lord lands on the Mount of Olives with an army. Now I know I'm giving you a lot. I'm going to go over it and go over it and go over it and go over it until you get it. So if you don't get it the first time, don't worry about it. Just get what you can get. Now what has to happen here is, is that that kingdom is set up and then the battle of Gog and Magog takes place. The judgment of nations happens after the battle of Armageddon. Thousand year millennial reign of Christ, battle of Gog and Magog. At the end of the battle of Gog and Magog, you have the great white throne judgment. Ladies and gentlemen, at the, battle, at the great white throne judgment, though it has always been taught contrary to the Bible, Revelation chapter number 11, you will have the wicked dead that will be judged that will come up out of hell and then they'll be judged there. But also the saints that were saved before Calvary that are not in the body of Christ, they receive their reward there. It's right in Revelation chapter 11. Well, I thought Jesus died you know, for everybody. That's a lazy man's way of teaching the Bible. Jesus did die for everybody, but everybody doesn't get the same thing. A fellow said, well, you say there's levels in heaven. There's not levels in heaven, but there's certainly rewards that differ in heaven. There's gold, which is different than silver, which is different than precious stones. There's wood, which is different than hay, which is different than stubble. In other words, you have entitlements that you're up there. Caleb in the Old Testament, he winds up getting the mountain because he asked for it, and the Lord rewards him for his faithfulness. Everybody doesn't get the mountain. Anybody to believe that you're going to get what Paul got and it's just going to be this communistic form of everything, you've lost your mind. You will all have eternal glorified body. Amen. You're going to be made in His image. Amen. Have His brain. That'll be the greatest thing for me. I'd like to have that. <laughs> have His brain. But once you get there, ladies and gentlemen, what you do on earth now will determine what you do for eternity. Nothing to do with your salvation. That has to do with what you do for Jesus Christ. When you get up there at the judgment seat of Christ, there's five crowns. You can earn those five crowns if you do the things for Jesus Christ that He asks you to do. And if you don't, then you don't get a crown. And if you don't have a crown, you're still saved, but you're not going to rule anything. Crowns are rulership. You can get any of those five crowns you want to get, but it boils down to simply this. When I, if I was to teach you on the crowns right now, I would sum it this way. Each of those crowns represents, I love Jesus Christ more than I loved myself. That's how you earn a crown. Now, and we'll talk about those that love is appearing this morning. That's one crown you ought to be able to get. You ought to be looking for Jesus Christ and pray that He would come right now. I'm not afraid of Him coming right now. Well, what about the judgment seat? Well, good, let's get it over with. I'd still rather be with Him. Yes. All right, Matthew, are you in Matthew chapter 3? Matthew chapter number 3, verse number 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye... I'm sorry, I thought I'd given it to you. Matthew chapter 3, excuse me, verse 2. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand... It means it's, it's here, it's about to show up, it's about to be present. You're about to get the opportunity to inherit the kingdom of heaven, the literal, physical, earthly kingdom. Why? There's the king that's showing up. Pilate says over there when he's judging Jesus Christ, he says in uh, the book of John, he says to him, he said, Behold your king. And they say, We have no king but Caesar. But he said, Behold your king, the king of the Jews. And he said, He said he's king of the Jews. Pilate says, What I have written, I have written, the king of the Jews. It's a throne. So he comes looking for what? They're looking for the Messiah. This is why there's confusion in Revelation chapter number 6 and still is to this day that individuals take that white horse rider in Revelation 6 and make him Jesus Christ because he doesn't have any arrows for his bow. 
That's the Antichrist who comes in and obtains the kingdoms by peace and flattery. He doesn't obtain them by a military dictatorship. When Jesus Christ comes to this earth again, not stops in the air, rapture, comes to the earth at the second coming, He has an army and He comes to take over by a military dictatorship. And it gets so bad that he stomps on all of his enemies to the point that the blood is up to the horse's bridles. That's anywhere between 12 and 16 hands high. That means about that deep. Hands are done this way. 12 to 16 hands high. The fellow says, well, what that means is the battlefield was bloody and the horse fell over and he got his bridle in the blood. No, no, not at all. It means that there's so many of his enemies that when he stomps on them, he treads out the wine press, his garments are soaked in blood, and it's a bloody takeover. It's a dictatorship. You get that messed up now, and you're going to be fighting your government and fighting other people and fighting other... You're not supposed to be having the second coming now. You're supposed to have a towel right now, not a sword. You're supposed to minister to people right now, not kill them. But the time will come when you come back at the second coming of Christ. There'll be plenty of killing for everybody. All right. Kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 3. If you're there, verse number 2. We said this. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 3. For this is that which is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Let's just look over there real quick. It'll be Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. When Isaiah is speaking, all of the prophets in the Old Testament, when they were getting together, what they were doing is, is they were talking about a physical rule. Now, you can go through the Bible, and we will during the process of this study, and I'll show you the veiled church in the Old Testament. And that's why when Jesus comes to Nicodemus in, in John chapter number 3, saying, don't you know your Bible? Hadn't you read the Scriptures? You know, you must be born again. And the fellow says, how can I be born again? Do I enter into the mother's womb? And he said, except you be born of the Spirit, and, I mean of the flesh and the Spirit of water and the Spirit, two births. You can't see the kingdom of God. Well, you said it's not, you can't see it. No, it's not meat and drink, Romans 14 and Luke 17. It's not seen with observation. How would I be able to see it? You'd have to have a glorified body to see it. It resides in you. Right now inside me is the kingdom of God. You say, no, there's a heart and there's a pericardium and there's a liver and there's lungs and there's all of the whole system that's there and your larynx is there and your thyroid is there and you go down into the small intestinal pleuric valve and this and that and the other in the stomach and then you pass through all that stuff and there's a gallbladder and there's a liver and there's a pancreas and there's this and there's that and all that kind of junk. Yeah, that's my physical body. But inside that's the kingdom of God and a ruler of it is inside me. And if you're saved, it's inside you. You said it don't even make sense. I told you it can't be seen with observation. The only way you'd see that is, is if you were able to have a glorified body. All right, Isaiah chapter number 40. Isaiah chapter number 40. Look if you will. Here he is. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. That's exactly what John the Baptist said. Make straight the desert, uh, uh, make straight in the desert, literal, physical, earthly, a highway for our God. A man coming down in the form of a God coming down in the form of man. Every valley, every mountain and hill made low. The places are, are made rough places made plain. That's all physical. Look a little further, verse 5. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. That's Jesus Christ. That goes all the way back over to Exodus when Moses said, Show me thy glory. And he shows him Jesus Christ, the hinder parts. And all flesh shall see it together. What's he talking about? Look, grass withereth, flower fadeth away. The Word of God is there. He's talking about a literal, physical, earthly kingdom. Now the reason that Jew didn't see this right here was because he was looking, like, looking for this. Now I want to help you with something, if I can please, and I uh, will try to be uh, uh, as definitive as I can be. There's a thing called the Mandela Effect. And people are talking about it now. Now what they're saying is, is that because of CERN that they went in and they went back in time and they changed your King James Bible and it doesn't really say what it says because they flipped it around. But because you've got the Mandela effect, it's you're, you're not seeing what it really says because you can't see it because you've already made up your mind how it really is. The Mandela effect is, is Mandela was out of, came out of prison and he stood up there in the insurrection there coming against apartheid and he stood up there and he began to talk and they said, that's uh, Mandela, that's Mandela. They said, it can't be Mandela. He died in prison. 
No, that's really him. No, he died in prison. That can't be him. Has to be an imposter. Can't be him at all. No, that's really him. No, I've already made up my mind. It can't be him. They told me he died. I believe he died. He's dead. I can't change that. How many of you have heard that the, uh, the, the lion and the lamb will lay down in the millennial kingdom? What's your Bible say? See, it says lion and lamb. <laughs> really? You've seen too many pictures and statues. It's the wolf and the lamb. Why would the Lord use lion and lamb when all through the Bible He likens wolves unto the ones tearing up sheep? <laughs> but see, the Mandela effect says, no, no, that's what's in there. How many of you have heard cleanliness is next to godliness? <laughs> Some of you need to work on that a little bit. <laughs> How many of you have heard that? You heard that before? It's nowhere in the Bible. How about this one? God helps those that help themselves. You heard that? <laughs> it's nowhere in the Bible. Now, you may have a principle that's in there that you could find, but you can't find verses for that. The Mandela effect is, is that they've made up their mind it's going to be a literal, physical, earthly kingdom. But in all fairness to them, ladies and gentlemen, that's all they were ever told to look for. Because since this guy right here lost the spiritual kingdom, since that guy right there, everything has changed until Jesus Christ shows up down there on the other side of Jeconiah after the time of the Gentiles, the captivity and all that, which we won't even get to today or maybe tonight. So this is a literal, physical, earthly kingdom. It generally will always involve Jews, a Jewish kingdom, works with, accompanied, and for salvation, always are involved. If you do, 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 then you will, then you will, then you will, then you will. Amen. If you do, then you'll be. But if you don't do, you won't. So in James chapter number 4, in the tribulation, you know what he says? Faith without what? You know what Baptist preacher has been preaching for years? If you're not working, you're not saved. You know what they quote? James chapter number 4. Well, that puts us all shot in the foot somewhere along the line. Nobody in here has worked all the time. You've done the best you can, but if you're honest, you haven't worked all the time doing the best you can. Well, faith without works is dead. I'll make a practical application of that. If an unsaved person is looking at me and thinks that I'm saved, it makes it easier for them to see salvation if I'm doing something for Jesus. But that's just an application. It has nothing to do with salvation. All right, now come to this one right here. Look at Romans chapter number 14. Romans chapter 14. To show you the difference in the two things. This one will deal with the Son of Man. Because it's literal and physical. And this one will deal with the Son of God. You're not looking for the Son of Man to come. That's why you can't have Matthew chapter 24 as verses for the rapture, like so many people are doing now. They go immediately to Matthew chapter number 24, and they start reading all these things, and they're saying because the earthquake is going off over in Hawaii right now, and there's tares and fissures in the land, and there's going to be a tsunami that's going to wipe out California and Alaska and all this, and there's, they're sending out tsunami warnings again, and this and that and the other. They're preparing people, and they're building the things because the great earthquakes are coming, and the sea is rising, and people's hearts are failing them because of that. They're quoting Scripture, but they're quoting stuff for the tribulation. You're, not gonna, you're gonna have tribulation, but you're not gonna go through the tribulation. Right. So when you go to you listen to a preacher, he gets up and says, Okay, we're gonna preach on the rapture today, Matthew 24. Wrong passage. Wrong passage. You can see a veiled truth all throughout the Song of Solomon about the rapture and different things like that, but that's because you got Pauline glasses on and you look back and see it. Right. Nobody, including Nicodemus and any of the Old Testament people, saw any of that. They didn't see you even existing. It was about Jews and their kingdom on earth. Lord, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debtors. We forgive those against us. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on as it is in... You're not bringing in the kingdom. Amen. The old time Southern Baptist. And if you're Southern Baptist, don't get nose out of joint. I was Southern Baptist since nine months before I was born. 
I understand Southern Baptist. I know Southern Baptist doctrine. I understand all of those things, ladies and gentlemen. But the bottom line is, is they would teach that we're building the kingdom. We're building the kingdom. We're building the kingdom. Bringing in the kingdom. Bringing in the kingdom. Bringing in the kingdom. That's why your church got involved in politics. Its basis is, is that if Christians are in the ruling class, we'll bring the kingdom in and make it so wonderful that God will show up and go, man, I am so pleased with this, it's unbelievable. And then He'll show down here, uh, show up down here after you've got everything fixed. After you got everything fixed. How's that working out for you? <laughs> I'll show you where every one of those kingdoms fails. I'll show you where you're going to fail. That's why you need His righteousness. Not by works of our righteousness that we have done. Amen. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags. So he gives them a chance to see his righteousness, but they miss both kingdoms. All right, are you in Romans 14? Look at verse number 17, talking about the kingdom of God. Verse uh, 17. 16 is just a good one to remember. Let not your good be evil spoken of. In other words, don't destroy your testimony because you do something stupid. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy where? Where? So wouldn't you agree that you'd have to be in the Holy Ghost in order to have that? Isn't it interesting that three of those things show up over in Galatians 5 as a fruit of the Holy Spirit? All right, how do I get in him? I got to be in Christ. For he, uh, for he, verse 18, for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable of God and approved of men. So how do I get it? I get in by what? New birth. Look at Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. When Jesus Christ shows up the first time, they're looking for, uh, they herald Him as the King of the Jews. They're taking off their garments and throwing them down on the ground. And they're saying, Hosanna to the King, Hosanna to the King. They think He's going to come kick Pilate and Caesar and Herod off the throne. They're going to get the Roman foot off their neck. And Jesus Christ is going to come in and the Jew is going to be venerated and lifted to the top and they're going to rule and reign because that's what the Bible predicted, 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 predicted. And when that didn't happen, that's why they rejected Him. And that's what they're still looking for. That's why in the tribulation it goes back to that preaching again because they're looking for their Messiah to come for a literal, physical, earthly kingdom. If a Jew wants to get saved now, he has to get saved the same way you're saved. Amen. There's a fellow out in Texas that teaches it doesn't matter what you tell the Jew, it doesn't matter what gospel you give him, it doesn't matter because the entire nation of Israel will be resurrected and given a second chance. And he uses Ezekiel 37 to prove it. That army of God has nothing to do with somebody getting a second chance to be saved. Right. Korah, Dathan, and Byron went to hell, sure as I'm standing here. Right. And all that appertained unto them. Say, so, well, it doesn't make any difference. Any Jew right now that rejects Jesus Christ as their Savior, as their Savior, not just their Messiah, as their Savior, dies and goes to hell. Right. You say, why? In the body of Christ, there's neither Jew, Gentile, bond free, male or female. Amen. Salvation is for everybody. And watch it, to the Jew first, and then also the Greek. But the Jew rejected. Romans 11, you get in because they rejected, and he did it to simply provoke them to jealousy. But as far as I'm concerned, we got the better end of the deal because I don't have to work to get it or keep it. And thank the Lord I don't have to work to prove I am. Because some Christians will never be happy no matter how much work you do. They'll still think you should be doing more. That Bible says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is... And my burden is, when you get saved, it's supposed to lighten your load, not add a burden to it. I think it's a great blessing to serve Jesus Christ. I do it because I love Him. I don't do it because I have to. I'm not worried about losing my salvation if I don't. I can't believe He lets me do it. For me, it's an amazing thing. I think, I think to myself, why would He let me do that? You can't explain it either because you're thinking to yourself, yeah, why would He let you do that? <laughs> All right, Luke chapter number 17, look in verse number 20. Luke 17, verse number 20. Uh, the Bible says this, And he was demanded of the Pharisees, When the kingdom of God should come. And he answered and said unto them, The kingdom of God cometh not with what? You can't see it. We've had in the last few weeks here, we've had folks saved. A big portion of them been saved back there in my office after church service is over with. We've had some saved right there sitting in the pews. They pray at the end of the service. They're afraid to come forward because they don't know what's going to happen with it. But we've had people saved. You didn't see it happen. 
You know how you know I'm saved? You think I am because of my testimony. But you can't see it. All right, notice he says, verse 21, Neither shall they say, Lo, here, and lo, there, for behold, the kingdom of God is where? Within you. Within you. you can't see it. It doesn't come with observation. The Jew is looking for something he can see. You get saved by something you can't see. We walk by and not by... How about that? What do they walk by? Signs are for the Greeks seek after. Wherefore, tongues are for a... Not to them that... But to them that... It's two different kingdoms. If you don't get those kingdoms straight in your Bible, you'll mess your Bible up from now on. You'll be trying to apply things to you that don't fit for you and trying to put other people in other things. And then you'll be trying to see uh, if I can figure out a way to get everybody in and get everybody saved. And I just believe if I was God, this is how I would do it kind of a deal. Oh, there's multiple plans of salvation in the Bible. Nobody believes that. That's another gospel. You know one verse. You know Galatians 1, 6 and 1, 9. You don't know what you're talking about. There are multiple plans of salvation. Noah never believed by grace through faith and he didn't look forward to the cross when he built the ark and realized that the ark was a type of the cross. Hey, listen, ladies and gentlemen, I don't mean to be insulting, but if you have a sixth grade education, if you just read what it says, it'll clear up a lot of problems for you. Nowhere in there, you're, you've added something to the Bible. You're saying, well, Noah had to be looking forward to the cross. How do you figure that? They never even saw that. What Bible was Noah looking to? Oh, I'm sorry, there wasn't one? Really? When he built the ark, he was like, now this is a type. You know what he preached? He preached a preacher of what? Righteousness. Do right. Live right. And get on the ark. Faith and works. It's going to rain. Yeah, sure, Noah, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. Sure, Noah. How long have you been preaching that? hundred years. Well, it ain't rained yet. I don't care. It's still going to rain. How long have you been preaching that, Noah? 115 years, 116 years, 117 years, 118 years. Noah, good night alive, man. This is the biggest joke I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, well, the ark's finished now. How long have you been preaching that, Noah? 120 years. What was that, Noah? Somebody who's blowing cannons off up there or something? What was that bright light flashing up there? <laughs> it's the sound of rain. Get in the ark, last chance. Nothing doing, Noah. You've lost your mind. The Lord shuts the door, and guess what? It came. I'm going to preach to you this morning. I know it's Mother's Day, but every mother would like to do the best for their kids. I'm going to preach to you about that day coming soon for you. Hopefully real soon. All right, now let's move down here and let me show you what happened. Uh, this thing happened a long time ago. The first words probably spoken in your Bible is in Isaiah chapter number 14. Turn there if you would please. Isaiah chapter number 14. The main theme of the Bible is authority. Isn't that interesting? And you know what we have a problem with? We have a problem with authority. We still have a problem with authority. Uh, the yea hath God said society raises up all the time and says you're not going to tell me what to do. We all have it. Don't just think of whoever is your enemy. We all have that thing. Jesus Christ uh, came down here and He gave both of the kingdoms, both spiritual and physical, to Lucifer, light bearer, the light, the light bearer, uh, a, a, a cherubim that was beauty, beautiful and wisdom and beauty were found in Him. His tabrets and pipes were found in Him until iniquity was also found in Him. Then His name got changed from Lucifer um, to Satan, the devil. And what happened was, is in Isaiah chapter number 14, and the reason I know this is, is because he's already in this form when this guy shows up. Amen. you got to get that. You say, well, I don't really know if he could really be because I just don't believe in... Okay, now you got a problem with this word right here. Don't you? You haven't read your Bible. Could I ask you this? I'll say this as kindly as possible. Do you think the Holy Spirit is smarter than you? Amen. You think He had the ability to foretell the future? Amen. I believe He did. Amen. Okay, how come in the same passage that the Lord tells uh, uh, Adam to be fruitful and replenish the earth, if replenish is supposed to be the word fill, how come He uses the word fill in the same passage in Genesis 2? 
when he talks about filling up the oceans there that didn't have fishes in it before when he made the whales. Whales weren't in the first creation. What's the matter? You have a problem with your Bible? If he wanted that word to be filled, he already penned it in the same passage and just a few verses ahead of that. He used replenish for a reason. Nobody I've ever talked to has ever had a problem right there. We know that Noah had to replenish because Adam lost it. But when we say Adam is told to replenish, we're like, well, that can't be because God started right here with Adam. Because why? Because, you know, man's the center of the universe. I like what that black preacher said one time. They said, preacher, where was God uh, in the beginning? He said, he was in the beginning. <laughs> he said, where was he? He said, dwelling in his holiness. He said, well, where was he? He said, he always was. God's not created. He always was. How do you figure that? I have no idea. Just know it's true. He didn't have a beginning. He just always was. Everything begins with him, not me and you. God's intent for this guy right here was to populate everything and everything to be perfect, but he left intact a free will. Isn't it interesting he gave that guy the same choice? Here's the most beautiful thing created right here. The most beautiful thing created. Created being that knows nearly as much as God does as a created being. God made him that way. You know what he said? I'm going to still give you a choice. You're going to let me be the ruler of you. He wasn't content. Ambition got the best of him. Frustrated ambition. Well, you're ruling over everything right now. What's the problem? I want more. I want more. I want more. I want more. Not content. Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state I'm in therewith to be. Amen. Contentment with, gain, with uh, godliness is what? Great. It's hard, isn't it? You get married and after you've been married about 30 years, you're thinking, wish I had a newer model. <laughs> yeah, so does she. <laughs> Yours is so broke down, they ain't even got parts for you anymore. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? Verse number 12, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne. My what? He was given a throne? Yes. He was ruling and reigning over the sons of God. Job chapter number 40. He's ruling and reigning over the sons of God. Right there. When the sons of God sang and shouted for joy, there he is. What's he doing? He's the ruler. He's got been given a throne. The Lord said, you got it. Take care of it. The sons of God are down here. I'm down here. Y'all sing praises to me. Have a good time. Enjoy yourself. The earth's floating out of the water and in the water. And boy, I mean, he's just having the time of his life. They don't procreate because they're angels. And I'll talk about that later. And a cherubim is over them. Thou is the fifth cherub that covers. The covering, old covering cherub. He's over all the other four cherubs. He's the one right up there underneath the throne. Right there. You know what he said? I'm going to put my throne. See it right there? I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. That's the Lord's throne. That's not His throne. He's saying, I'm going to boot Him off. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Why? He's down on earth. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, the sides of the pit. All right, so both of those kingdoms are given there, and then the Lord kicks the thing away, and that's in uh, Genesis, oh, come all the way to Genesis chapter number 1. Genesis chapter number 1. I hope this is interesting to you. Amen. Now, uh, after Adam comes along here, or after Satan messes the thing up, the Lord comes to Adam and He says, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, because it was plentiful before, just not with human beings, with angelic beings. What were they like? I don't know, it seemed to be like men, but I wasn't there. One fellow said, Well, they were all rocks. I said, They were rocks. 
He said, yes, they had to have been rocks. They were rock creatures. I don't, I don't even, I, sometimes I just think to myself, should I even try to answer that? I'm so perplexed that you would, where would you, they're rock creatures. I'll grant you that every precious stone was his covering, according to what Ezekiel says. I'll grant you that it looks geological in nature, but to make the creatures that way, I grant you that in Adam's creation, it's more botanical than it is geological. I'll grant you that. I give you that. But to say that these are rock creatures, it's just something out of a sci-fi movie or something. Well, you got rocks walking around. Anyway. Uh, Adam comes along right here and the Lord says, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a man and I'm going to make him. You want to get this in my image. These people will tell you that when Adam ate of the fruit, he didn't die spiritually. There's nothing in the Bible about him dying spiritually. He did die spiritually. He lost the kingdom of God and he lost God's image. Genesis chapter number 5, he dies and everything after him dies. First Adam, you wouldn't have died. Or the last Adam, you wouldn't die. The first Adam, you die. Why? You're in Adam's image now. You're not made in the image of God anymore other than having a body, soul, and a spirit. But Adam was made in that. He was clothed in light. He lost his shine. Man's always looking to get that shine back. All right, Genesis uh, chapter number 1. Look, if you will, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let, uh, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. Let them have what? Dominion. He's a ruler. He's in charge. Over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in His own image. The image of God created He Him. Male and female created Him them. Boy, you better be careful right there. Because if you don't keep reading, you know what you think? You think you're still created in God's image and therefore everybody has an innate goodness about them. You better keep reading and realize you're created as a sinner. <laughs> and that as soon as you recognize what sin is, then guess what happens? Sin revives and you die. Sin revives and you die. Now let me show you the, how, how ludicrous, how stupid, how, how uninformed these dare I say, biblical midgets are when they tell you you don't die. Uh, let's see, who just had a baby here not long ago? Rebecca just had a baby here not long ago. All right, that baby right now, that soul's connected to that flesh. If something were to happen like the rapture were to take place or God forbid some disease or something that's happened to some of our folks here and that baby is taken before it comes to an age of knowing what sin is, that baby is safe. You say, why? Sin's not imputed to them because they don't know what sin is. Amen. What great peace is that? Amen. I got a guaranteed package in the world in which you live. It's kind of like, I'll keep you till seven or eight and you better get saved because if you don't, I get really worried about you. You say, why? Because you want them to be saved. Can I say, sort of in a sense of trying to be a comfort to you, maybe your kids haven't done right, but thank God they're saved. If they got saved, thank the Lord. They can't back up on that one. So at least they got that part right. Well, they ain't going to get nothing. Judgment seat of Christ. Who cares? <laughs> when you get up there and get the mind of Christ, you won't worry about your reputation anyway. Isn't that your kid? Yeah, it belongs to God. don't belong to me. <laughs> they got saved. They don't belong to me no more. You won't be worried about your reputation. All right, that little baby uh, uh, grows up and all of a sudden one day walks in there to Matt, like just happened with his youngin the other day, and says, Daddy, uh, I, I did something wrong. And Matt says, okay, well, I understand that. And maybe he has to paddle him or time out him or whatever he happens to do for discipline. He goes, no, Daddy, I feel bad about it. I feel real bad about it. And he begins to grasp that his sin is not just right and wrong, but now he's sinning against a God. And that when he sins against God, he realizes, I'm in some serious trouble here. And then after he gets an understanding of that, sin revives and he dies and his soul's cut away from, I mean, his soul is now connected to his flesh because his flesh is sinful. And guess what happens? Now he's lost and dead, dead, dead in trespasses and sin. He's not born that way. They're like this when they're born. The flesh is 
whatever it is, and the soul is here, as soon as the flesh recognizes it, Paul says, sin revived and I died. Now, that's what happened here. He was fine until he sinned. And when he sinned, he died spiritually. He needed a covering. And God gave him a covering. No matter what age you were when you got saved, you know what you had to realize? You had to realize sin revived and you were dead in trespasses and sin. You did die spiritually. Different ages for different people. Some kids get it 8, 9, 10 years of age. We had one girl come over here and got saved, 16 years old. She said, I have never heard of Jesus. I know it's hard to imagine, but she hadn't heard of Jesus. I preach to people in other countries that haven't heard of Jesus, and they're old enough to have known about Him, but they don't know what we know. You don't know what that age is. What's the age of accountability? It is the age where you realize your sin is against God, and you're going to go to hell and pay for it if you don't get a, a payment for it. Amen. Sin revived and he died, but when he sinned, guess what happened? He lost God's image. With that right there, at that moment right there, the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom left. And it doesn't show up until the Lord shows up preaching in Matthew chapter number 3, which you just read about. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven don't show back up. Right here, the Lord turns it over to men. Right here, He gets a nation. And then He gives them the law. Gives them the judges to try to straighten them out. I'm going to go through all this. I'm giving you an overview. Tries to get them straightened out using other nations to whip them into shape. And they do right for a while under one judge and then the judge dies. And then they go back to sinning again. And then they get another judge and they do right. And then they go back to sinning again. And so on and so forth and so on and so forth. Until all of a sudden they say, we want a physical king. We don't want God as our king anymore. We have no king. We want a king like the other nations have a king. And Samuel said, God's your king. We don't want God a king, a, a king we can't see. Samuel says, you've lost your mind. And they say, well, you don't have, your, your family didn't turn out right. Your kids are not going to be able to pick up the mantle after you're gone. Your kids are preacher's kids. They're just a bunch of stinking dirt bags. They're good for nothing. We don't want them being in charge of us. Got no problem with you, Sam, but we got a problem with your kids. They didn't turn out right. Must have been playing with the deacon's kids. We, we want, we, we want our own physical king. You know what the Lord told Samuel? Give him a king. And he gave him a king after their heart's desire. And he messed it up. And he called out another king after his own heart. And it got turned over to him and he messed it up. And then it runs on down through kings and kings and kings and kings until he comes to a man, this will be in Jeremiah 22, until he comes up on a man named Jeconiah. And that man is so wicked that he cuts the J off of his name and makes him just Kaniah, and he fixes it where nobody from that seed can prosper. Now you may not think that's any big deal at all. That's a huge deal. That's one of the greatest prophecies of the virgin birth of Christ there is. That guy would have been in the lineage of Jesus Christ if, you, if he hadn't marked him right there and said, he's not going to produce seed, and he's not going to have anybody after him in seed. You say, why? The Savior of the world came and the God was his father. Otherwise, they'd be saying it came from here. God cursed that man. He cursed him so bad, he took the, any reference to Jesus off of him. To Jehovah. Ain't that something? Yahshua. <laughs> That's what he does right there. I don't know what time it is. Y'all look like you're drooling. <laughs> it's 1030. Uh, let me give you this thing real quick here. Look in Genesis chapter number 5. Genesis 5. If I could stay on this till the cows come home. If you get this thing right, you know what will happen? You'll get your Bible down so pat that you'll begin to realize, oh my goodness, man, this whole thing is a battle for a throne. And if I get that thing right, I can know exactly where my passages fit and how the Bible fits for me in this day and time and the day and time in which I live. Are the little ones here yet? Are they waiting right there? 30 okay, good. I need 30 seconds. Don't come in until I tell you. Genesis 5, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son. Look at there. In what? His own likeness. After his image, and he called his name Seth. Now let me ask you a question. Have any of you ever been taught, any of you ever heard, that we're all born in the kingdom of God, in the, uh, the image of the Lord of God, and therefore we're all brothers and sisters in God in one big family? You ever been taught that? 
They used to teach it all the time. You know what that means? You break down all the barriers, denominationally and doctrinally, and we're all just the same. No, we're not the same. You're saved, you're the same. If you're lost, you're not. You're saved, you're in. You're lost, you're not. You want to be in the family of God, you've got to get in Jesus Christ. You've got to get the right kingdom. You know what the Muslims are looking for? You know what the Catholics are looking for? You know what the Charismatics are looking for? You know what every war that's been fought to obtain the world rulership? World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the one that's coming. You know what it's for? It's for world domination. It's for this kingdom. You know what you're looking for? That one. You ain't got to worry about that. You say, why? You come down here and get to enjoy it for a honeymoon. And you look around and say, well, that's real nice. That's real pretty and stuff. But ain't nothing like the New Jerusalem. You ought to see Pluto. Oh, y'all haven't seen it. You ought to see Saturn. You ought to see Mars. You ought to see all the other planets in the solar system you don't even know about. Right now, the Lord's got the thing walled off. But after the great white throne judgment of His kingdom, there'll be no end. It won't have no walls. It'll go on forever and 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 forever until God dies. And you get to visit anytime. You've got a complete one-way platinum pass anytime you want to go. You get that. They get a literal, physical, earthly kingdom. All right, are the little ones ready? This is Mother's Day now. 